Amen. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Uh, we, yeah, we continue in uh, today in our study of the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Uh, the subject of our chapter today, chapter 16, will be on good works. Uh, today, in particular, we'll be looking at paragraph four as we begin to examine the limitations of good works. Right. Just uh, just a quick disclaimer. Paragraph four, I was just mentioning to Greg, is um, it's a rather brief paragraph. Um, honestly, it probably could have been coupled together with paragraph five because they're both speaking on limitations. Um, and we'll see that next week, but that, but that's fine. Um, so to get the most out of our time this morning, I, I thought it best uh, to provide a, a lengthier than usual recap of paragraphs one through three, which we've heard over the past two weeks. Phil, um, two weeks ago, uh, told on paragraphs one and two, Greg last week on paragraph three. Um, so what we'll do is we'll review those paragraphs um, as a recap and on our way to paragraph four and hopefully reinforce what we've learned um, about the identity, importance, and source of good works. Um, but before we begin, let's um, ask the Lord for his grace um, to help us learn and uh, glean much from his word. Uh, Father, Lord, we thank you so much, O oh God, for your grace, O oh Lord, and uh, revealing to us uh, your will, O oh Lord, and your Son, and, and, and for saving us, O oh God. Lord, thank you for drawing us to him, O oh Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, which enables us to uh, do good works unto you, O oh Lord, whereas once we were in the world and we thought we were good people, O oh Lord, we thought we were uh, doing what was right, but we were merely offering you filthy rags, O oh God. Lord, I thank you that your grace, uh, Lord, overcame our sin, O oh God, and, and now, O oh Lord, our, our works are redeemed in Christ, O oh Lord. You see them in Christ and, and through him, and we uh, can, we're so overjoyed that we can take part, O oh Lord, in, in your kingdom being built, O oh Father God, and in, in what small ways we can, as unworthy as we are. We thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. So uh, paragraph one, which, which you should have uh, top of your sheet. Again, just going over, we reads, good works are only those works that God has commanded in his holy word. Works that do not have this warrant are invented by people out of blind zeal or on a pretense of good intentions and are not truly good. All right, amen. So the week before last, again, as I mentioned, Phil taught us about the identity, right, or standard uh, of good works. Looking again at paragraph one, we're reminded uh, that good works aren't merely the noble pursuits of men, right, or, the, or even the various causes of our culture, uh, both of which are often subject to change anyway, right? Uh, and what do we mean by that? Well, for one, uh, we live in a society that barely knows its right hand from its left. Right? Evidently, we have that in common with uh, the Ninevites, according to God in Jonah 4.11, further showing that there's nothing new under the sun. Right? Even still, consider the fact that we currently have a sitting Supreme Court justice right, who in her own confirmation hearing was not willing, uh, able nor willing to define what a woman was when asked even under oath. Um, now, we might scoff at that, uh, and in truth, it is quite ridiculous. Uh, but honestly, it's really sad when we think about it, right? Especially when we consider at this very moment, there's an entire generation of kids being raised uh, just directly in the midst of all of this confusion, right? Uh, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean, you know, uh, to have roles? You know, and this is a generation that gets its moral authority not from the word of God, sadly, uh, nor even basic biology, which is, of course, rooted in, in a reality that God himself ordered, but rather who get their, their, their moral authority and, and compass from from their lesbian school teacher on TikTok, right? Or their occult music artists at the Grammys. Um, this, this, is, this is what we're in, right? And the same generation will then accuse the Christian, right? Us of being evil, hateful, intolerant, um, and, 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 and ignorant, right? Simply because we don't like them engaging or affirm in the things, in the lifestyles that they claim to be acceptable and even right before God, right? Um, they'll be quick to remind us God is love. You know, you know, you've heard it before. God is love. So why can't you just mind your business? Right. And, and simply play along. Live and let live. Sadly, the church even is is being and it has been for some time now uh, influenced by this way of thinking. Right. There are many Christians or so-called Christians who've adopted this mindset, uh, taking up causes in sync with the LGBTQ agenda. Right. Championing that pro-choice abortion movement. We matter radical feminism, critical race theory and all of these things that are in opposition to God's word and, and, and just bring up walls of division, right? The list goes on and on. And what this creates and even exacerbates, right, is a tremendous confusion as to what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. Naturally, this brings into question then what is a good work, 
right? If, if there's already this confusion about what is right, wrong, good, evil, what is a good work, you know? Um, but lest we look at the culture in those churches as the others, right? Uh, and, and presume of ourselves to be the real Christians, right? The ones incapable of missing the mark. Well, what about us? You know, are we faultless, right? You know, the thing that good works aren't, right? Uh, they're not just, again, the noble causes and pursuits of men. They're also not our preferences, um, right? And what do I mean by that? I like the chairs set up this way. If they're not set up this way, it's not right. You know, we shouldn't include songs in our liturgy that whose writer or composer hasn't been dead for over a century. I want the old hymns and only that. You know, why do we got to read the NKGV every Sunday morning? Why can't we read the old KGV or the e ESV, right? These, these are our preferences. Um, and, and oftentimes we will sort of look at good works through the frame of our preferences, which is, which is another error, right? Good works aren't determined by our consciences either, right? I don't drink. That stuff's poison. It's sinful, yeah. you know? And, and while for some personally, that may very well be, uh, that re reason may very well be valid, right? According to their conscience. But the, does that then make it applicable across the board, right? Um, no. For instance, if you're a new believer who'd recently been saved out of sin and out of alcoholism, uh, you might tend to repudiate even the mere whiff of, of alcohol, right? And understandably so. Uh, but then that, does that then disqualify a more mature believer uh, or brother who can responsibly enjoy a glass of wine with his wife on his anniversary? No. I mean, because if it does, you'd have to disqualify the Lord Jesus himself, right? His first public ministry uh, 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 not ministry, but public uh, miracle was the what he did at the wedding in Canaan in Galilee, right? Uh, provided between 120 and 360 gallons of, of the best stuff there, right? And then, of course, there's the Last Supper, the blood of the New Covenant, not represented in grape juice. Uh, Matthew 26, you'd also have to knock off the Apostle Paul, right? He told his, his son in the faith, Timothy, in uh, 1 Timothy 5.3, you know, drink, don't drink only water, but also wine for your stomach, right? He had a stomach ailment. But now, of course, there are certainly other considerations uh, when engaging in our Christian liberties, right? Uh, both, uh, both alone, right? But especially before unbelievers and also, you know, weaker brothers and sisters in the faith, right? We, we, we want to consider humility, wisdom, and love, right? We're not going to always do things. When it comes, uh, and I hate to use these words just because of how watered down they are in our days, but we're not going to just do things uh, that we know will likely trigger people or offend people. Uh, because we know that we can, right? But because we know it's legal to do so. Um, if we're witnessing the people from other cultures and backgrounds, uh, we're not going to um, do things that we know will be uh, offensive to them because then that becomes a stumbling block for them, right? And potentially it becomes a, 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 a sort of uh, a potential barrier to the reception of the gospel. And we don't want anything to stand in the way of someone receiving the gospel, but the gospel itself, right? Um, and that's at least in part what it means to be winsome, right? To be wise as serpents, gentle as doves, to be blameless and above reproach. Um, nevertheless, we don't wish to bind, right? As Pastor Phil mentioned um, two weeks ago, other saints by our preferences. Uh, that's precisely what the Pharisees did. Phil brought up the episode from Matthew 15 uh, concerning the grievances that they had with Jesus and his disciples for not washing their hands before eating, right? And that wasn't so much out of uh, concern for sanitary issues, but more for... Uh, of course, traditional and ceremonial uh, concerns, right? The traditions of their elders, right? But while they were looking at the outward, right, uh, form and ritual of things, Jesus was looking inward at the heart, right? And he, and he immediately, he flips the script on them. Uh, he asked in Matthew 15, 3, and, and why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition, right? And many do this even now. Uh, in fact, when we look at Roman Catholic uh, orthodoxy, right, which is what they believe, or orthopraxy, right, it was how they live in light of what they believe, um, both today and from its inception, we see uh, how it was and is an overemphasis of the traditions of men, right? The traditions of elders, of bishops, of sort of hierarchical structures um, that uh, rather than the rightly divided truths of God's word and God's word alone, that largely created the divide that exists between them and us today, right? Even going back to the third, fourth centuries. Um, uh, no doubt many of them are very zealous, right? And perhaps even well-intentioned in in. In fact, I dare say, purely in terms of like mercy ministries and hospitality, things like that, they got some of us true Christians beat, right? In terms of Roman Catholic ministries and just the things that they do. But, but as the saying goes, right, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's, it's not about good intention. And that brings us back to what I was talking about earlier about good works are just not things that we think are good, right? Um, 
it, it's it's not enough, right? Zeal devoid of, of of knowledge and truth is blind, right? As the confession says, and that's what paragraph one tells us. Uh, Apostle Paul, when talking about his own countrymen, the Jews, in Romans ten, alludes to just that. If someone would read Romans ten one through four, I believe I have that for you. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Hmm. Amen. That's, and that's just it, right? Like, Good works aren't our hobby horses, right? They aren't our personal passions and, you know, desires or man-made traditions. Rather, they are the imperatives of Scripture. You guys know what imperatives are? What imperatives mean? I know it, but I cannot say in English. Yes, you know, it's basically commands, right? Things that we're instructed to do, um, both explicit and nuanced, the imperative of Scriptures, right? Um, they, they are identified uh, by and only by uh, the commands found in God's law, His holy word. Right, and that 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 sort of uh, details the the identity of good works where where where, where they found. Right, Second Peter one three to four, we read, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Right. So looking at that, that, that brief passage, from what do we obtain this knowledge? Right. And from where, uh, do we derive these very precious, uh, and great promises, but by his revealed will? What, what is his revealed will? His word. Right. That's how we know about him. That's how we know about him specifically. Right. Um, now in rightly understanding how good works are defined, uh, and by what standard we can identify them. Again, that's God's word. We're led to, to then ask uh, a series of follow ups. Right. Uh, what do the scriptures tell us about good works? What do they look like? Right. We know that they're found in the scriptures. And we know that the scriptures alone define them. That's the standard of good works. But, but what are they? What kind of things are these works? You know, what do they look like? Uh, um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the scriptures say much about good works. Right. Uh, they're chock full of commands about good works. You can go to um, you can go to every practically every book in the Bible and find some sort of imperative, whether it's to turn from your sin or whether it's to, to love one another or, or X, Y, and Z, all over the scriptures, right? Uh, we know that they're found and determined by God's word and, and, and the scriptures are full of them, right? But don't take my word for it. Uh, let's go to God's, 2 Timothy three sixteen to 17. If someone might read that. All scriptures read out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. So one of the one of the very aims of Scripture, as it relates to us, is is that we would be complete and equipped for every good work. There are at least four in that in, in that passage that Jose just read, right? Teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Uh, right. The, okay. We can go back to the Old Testament, right? The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, known as the Torah, right? Meaning law or instruction in Hebrew. Uh, they that helps to shed some light on this too, right? And although contained therein, right, contained in the Torah, we find a wide variety of literary genres from narrative to poetry, even prophecy. A good chunk of it, particularly from about Exodus 20 onward, is law and instruction. Uh, right. And that's why it's known as the law or how Israel, right, um, and the people of God were to conduct themselves in the world. Right? At the forefront of that, we have the Ten Commandments, right, God's moral and universal law. These laws aren't an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts, as many might uh, think of them, right? Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're purposeful, right? And, and rather a very reflection of God's own, uh, immutable attributes, right? They reveal to us his character, even in his law, right? Consider the supremacy and oneness of our triune God, right? There are none others beside him. No one else is like him. Therefore, other gods, lowercase g, right? Not real gods, and idols of the heart, right? It's another way we can extrapolate that, um, are simply unacceptable. Right. Because God is the only true God. Right. So when we look at those first two commandments, that reveals to us about just just the supremacy and oneness of him. Right. Even though he's trying uh, because he is holy, holy, holy. Even his name is to be reverenced. Right. It's not to be spoken of lightly or taken in vain. Right. Commandment number three in the Old Testament observance of the Sabbath was a reflection of God 
uh, resting from his six day work in, in, in creation, right? We know God is an omnip- omnipotent spirit, right? Meaning he's all powerful. He's not capable of, of growing weary or needing actual rest, right? So what we see in this fourth commandment is his goodness towards we who are finite, right? A point that Jesus later clarifies to the religious elite of his day, right? They'd accuse him and his disciples of, of law breaking because he would heal on the Sabbath. Right. In one instance, they found his disciples while hungry in a field, plucking heads of grain. Right. And sought to accuse them. Um, we see those in, in Mark chapters two, three, as well as in Matthew 12 and Luke six. Right. However, he reminds his accusers that he, one, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Right. Which which is a claim to deity. Um, but also that therefore he determines how it's enforced. Right. And not them. Furthermore, he explains that the Sabbath was made for man and not the other way around. Um, Right, uh, we're under the new covenant. We realize that the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ, as is all of the law, and He Himself is our Sabbath rest. Right, spiritually speaking, we can look to Hebrews four for that. Right, um, therefore, we're not liable to judgment on account of either keeping or not keeping it. Right, Sabbath adherence or the lack thereof. Colossians uh, two sixteen talks about that. Let no one pass judgment in regard to new moons, festivals, Sabbath keeping, and all that. Um, and as we read early in Romans uh, ten four, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The horizontal commandments, right? Those commands having to do with how we relate to one another, namely commandments five through 10, also reveal certain truths about God's character, right? Honoring mother and father. This reveals the hierarchical nature of, of, the famili- of, of familial authority, even within the Godhead itself, right? It shows that God is an orderly God as well, right? That there's structure to things. The first person of the Trinity is a father. He, he's the father, right? And, and therefore the second is his son, uh, of course. Uh, and from eternity past, there's existed this harmonious relationship, right, between uh, the Father and the Son, right? And the Son was, was willfully submitting himself uh, to the Father's will, right? And, and, and even though that we know that they're the same form, we see this in Philippians 2.6, John 14.9, um, yet we know Jesus was obedient and submissive to his Father, um, right? And, of course, the Father loves and honors his Son as well. That, um, <clears throat> and being that... It's the only commandment of the promise, right? We know that the promise was long life in the land and prosperity. Uh, We also see how important it is that we follow suit, right? Because if you can't honor your parents, you're likely not to honor any authority over you, right? Your your parents would be the closest and most, or or maybe you don't have parents, but a sort of parental authority. If you're not honoring them, who who else in this world are you honoring, to be honest, right? Um, uh, You're likely not to honor anyone, and certainly not God, right? Because it's one of the ways we relate to God, right, in our relationship with God is, is he is our father as well, right? Um, right, and, and that, so the lack of that, right, the lack of that acknowledgement and that obedience um, breeds anarchy, right, and even worse, it incurs God's wrath, right? We mustn't murder. Why? Because God is the living God, right? And he's the author of life, right? We mustn't commit adultery. Why? Because God's faithful. We mustn't steal because God is generous, right? He, he, he provides for all who need and, and to each their own, right? Therefore, we don't steal. We don't take from others. We mustn't bear false witness because God is just. He's also true, right? Um, we mustn't covet because God is self-sufficient, right? And he's also sufficient for all. Therefore, we don't need to look at others and what they have and think about what we don't have, right? Because we have God. So with all the commandments we have from God in the Bible, right? To do this, do that, to love the Lord and God. Why would anybody want to create more just... Uh, fallacious, you know, phony commandments that have nothing to do with the Bible. It's a lot of motives, right? But when we look at the Pharisees, right, we see that they had a certain reward that Jesus would reveal, right? The things that they did in public, the extra things, right? He said they had received their reward. Their reward was the, the attention of men, the acclaim. They wanted the praise. They wanted the glory for themselves. And so in doing all of these rules to make it very hard and to, to, to display that we're the elite ones, they would add all these laws, right? And then we end up seeing that there were 613 or something like that laws that they added, just extra burdens. And, and in contrast, we see Jesus, right? Learn from me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know, he, he was pointing us to God's word, right? And, and nothing more, nothing less. We don't add or we don't take away. Great question. Um, I remember from a, reading a commentary, um, like, uh, it, it talked about, like, you know, like, like the Pharisees and, like, all these, like, you know, traditions that they always came up with. I remember like reading like one of like the reasons of why they always like came up with so much is because at to a certain point they knew that they couldn't fulfill God's law. So then like in terms of like like, like the whole like whole being pure in heart, right? All these things about like okay, like having to like um 
wash your hands before you touch any things, right? Like, you know, clean certain things, right? Um, from what I remember is that they try to like always like reduce the standard, mm. but by bringing so many extra things, yet they still couldn't keep it, and then they added even more of the burden on themselves. Yeah, that's one of the things that I remember reading. Yeah, no, it's true. You know, and they obviously did things try to like skirt the law, right? Um, the certificate of divorce with Moses. How basically you can divorce your wife for burning the toast and just other things, other things that they did to try to skirt, right? And, and uh, it, ultimately, it just they were just incurring more wrath and, and unnecessarily so, you know. And it's it's, it's sad. And again, many today that that do the same thing and think I got to do this, I got to fulfill this. Yeah, uh, just to to add. To, to what Anthony was saying, you know, I, I still remember my experience when, when I was in Spanish church. You know, um, there was always one demand after another. I, I, I remember being being a teenager, I was about 17, 18 years old, and oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't. It's the same, you know. And I, I was going through a period in my life where I lost my identity. You know, who who, who was I? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but but just to that point where I just got totally frustrated. And I'm not the only one that has that, that felt that way at that time. See, because we, we, there was a big gap where you had, you know, the, 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 el the elderly, you know, uh, members of the church being critical of the young people as opposed to speaking life into them. You know, so everything, I was always surrounded by legalism. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, if you don't do this, if you don't, you know, worship the Lord this way, you know, you're cold, and, and I was raised with that, and it was really frustrating. It was annoying. Yeah, you it's know? like you know, Pilgrim's Progress, right? When he gets to the to the mountain, it's just this weight of legalism that's just you can't you can't overcome it, right? And in Christ, really, that's the beauty of Christ, right? And that He's the fulfillment of the law. Um, in that, in that, given His Spirit, we we obey not out of you know. Yes, out of duty in a sense of obligation, but but more out of thankfulness, right, and joy, right, that that Christ did the work, and now I can just live for Him, right. It's not it's not this fear and this dread of I need to be this and I need to bear this weight. Um, yeah. So, Amen. Uh, can, I, so can I just say one, one thing? It, yeah. It'll be short. You know, and just thinking about this past week of prayer and fasting, you know, it, and and it's it's like you you know you proclaim a fast. So that you you can you can overcome you know those things that are holding you back, including worshiping the Lord. That when you are in service to Christ, you do it with joy. Mm -hmm. You know, you do it you know with love. You know, you, you, you do it to bring Him glory. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's that's why the church is the church. Mm -hmm. You know, to be a light in the midst of darkness, and, and the world sees a lot of things. They say, oh man, you know, you guys think that you're better than anybody than, than us and everything. No, you know, but we're here because because out of our love for you, mm -hmm. we will preach the gospel. That's the good work. Mm -hmm. See, because he has begun a good work in us. We were sons of disobedience. Now we're children of light. Mm -hmm. What is the good work? The gospel. Mm -hmm. The gospel that that you know that that the seed of the gospel. That, that has germinated in our hearts mm -hmm. to go forth into this world. Amen. Amen. Yeah, no, so true. It has to be out of joy and love, right? Where there again, there's a sense of duty and obligation, right? When we think about Paul when he writes to Timothy and he talks about uh being a soldier, right? We're, we're enlisted, but we're enlisted to please, Amen. right? To please the one who enlists us. Right? So there's this duty, but there's also this sense of like joy. We want to do this. You know? It's not just we have to do it, it's we get to do this and we want to do it. Um, and that's that's obviously the fruit of a redeemed heart, of a regenerate heart, um, right? And all this is summarized, right? When we were just going through the law, uh, in what's known as the greatest commandment, right? The Shema Yisrael, uh, Deuteronomy six four through five. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, right? Jesus reiterates this very point, expounding upon it in the New Testament, right? When he responds to certain a certain Pharisee who questions him, uh, Matthew twenty two thirty seven to forty. And he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, uh, uh, with all your soul, and with all your mind. There it is. This is the great and first commandment. Then he has this. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Right now, Jesus wasn't, wasn't adding to God's law when he brought up that point about loving uh, neighbors. Right. You may notice that the language used in verse 39 and 40, which we just read, aren't exactly found in Deuteronomy 6. Right. But again, this is because... 
some scriptural imperatives, right, um, commands are, are more nuanced and can have differing applications and yet still be obeyed faithfully, right? The commands for husbands to love their wives, for instance, uh, for parents to instruct their children in the way can be rightly and faithfully obeyed and yet look differently from household to household. Um, and nonetheless, into Jesus's point, it logically follows that loving God with all of your being, right, which is essentially what that's calling us to do, will inevitably result in, in loving the creatures he's made, especially those he's made in God's image, his own image, right? Who, who would he make in God's image? All people, our neighbors, right? That's everyone, not right? just the one who's lived next door. It's, it's everyone, including our enemies, right? Unlike the civil slash judicial and ceremonial laws, which were also given to Israel simultaneously, God's moral law is applicable to all people throughout all time, uh, everywhere, right? In, in fact, all of those other laws were ultimately uh, derived from and based in the moral law, right? For instance, in obeying the commands concerning various procedures for ritual sacrifice uh, uh, or in mandatorily observing the, uh, the high holidays, right, the commemorative holidays, one would be in principle, right, uh, at least from, if they're doing it from the heart, loving and submitting themselves to the one true God who both delivers and preserves, right, preserves them. And that's why they can celebrate Passover and, and Yom Kippur and all of these things year after year and year, remembering what the Lord has done in delivering and preserving them. Right. And not harvesting your crops completely, but leaving a small portion of its yield around the perimeters of your land so that the poor can glean. Right. Indeed, you were loving your neighbor. Right. Or at least that was supposed to be the spirit of that law. Right. You were allowing uh, sort of the, the general welfare of those around you. Right. Obedience by faith and from the heart is part and, part and parcel with worship. Right. Worship is not just something that we do on days like today. Right. Once a week on Sunday mornings. Right. It's that which we engage in every day as we surrender our wills to God's will and as we obey in faith, right? The obedience of faith. Paul talks about this in Romans, right? But bringing it a little bit closer to home here in the New Testament, right? Under the new covenant, we see commands for good works all over the place, right? Far too many to cover in just one lesson. Um, so for the sake of time, maybe we can do this as an exercise really briefly. Look at Romans 12. If you can turn with me in your copy of the scriptures, if you have to Romans 12. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul up to this point has been carefully and methodically laying out a case centered on the righteousness of God, right, as revealed both in his justice and also in his great salvation through the gospel of Christ. That's that's essentially Romans 1 to 12. Um, Romans 12 to 15 is now the application of that, right? And in that application, we can we can identify some good works, right? And so what I want for you guys to do, right, yet now I'm putting you to work, uh, to see if you can see if you can identify in Romans 12 just, just a handful of these good works, uh, things that we're commanded to do in Scripture that come from, an, from one from the gospel, right, as, as Jose said, being germinated in our hearts um, and, and that we do for the glory of God. Anyone could just, you know, yell it out if you have it. Not to take uh, the table of sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Mm -hmm. Humility, right, not to look more haughtily at others, you know, thinking... Why is this person not doing this or that? It's like, well, we, we were each granted different, differing gifts, right? And serving different purposes uh, akin to a body, right? We have fingers, we have eyes, we have nose, all serving different functions, all part of the same body, right? Um, and so whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. You do it with your all. Um, does anyone identify anything else? It says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Amen. I mean, we, we, we show honor to, to all, but especially the household of faith, right? Especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We love them, right? In fact, we're, we're known by our love for one another in the world, right? When they see how we love one another and how we're willing to uh, give of ourselves to one another, that's, that's attractive. That's appealing. In the very least, it's intriguing. Um, perhaps maybe one more. Someone? Romans 12, 12 to 15, you say? Uh, so, so Romans chapter 12, just, we're just identifying just a few examples of good works, right? Because we're trying to like figure out what are some of these good works? How do they look like? Bless those who persecute me. Bless and do not curse them. Mm. The whole chapter is one. The whole chapter. One command to turn up. Absolutely. It's, it, it, um, basically marks of a, uh, of, a, of a true Christian, right? Marks of faith, right? You know you have faith because faith is revealed and evidenced by these things that you do. In Romans 12, you basically see all of that. Uh, you know, not reviling your enemies, but loving them. Jesus literally did that on the cross, right? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? He'd been crucified and he's saying this about us about the, about some of the centurions about you know some of the jews who would who would eventually turn from their their, their works righteousness and turn to his righteousness um so amen right we, we see these examples of, of good works if you're ever wondering what some of these looks like you can go to romans 12 and there's obviously they're all over the scriptures
we're moving on. Amen. Uh, I believe we thoroughly understand what good works are, but now we need to review why they're so important, right? And paragraph two of our chapter really uh, crystallizes that for us. There we read, and I'll read it brief. Um, these good works done in obedience to God's commands, commandments are the fruit and evidence of the true and living faith. Uh, through good works, believers express their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, build up um, their brothers and sisters, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of opponents, and glorify God. Believers are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works so that they bear fruit leading to holiness and have the outcome, eternal life. All right, so firstly, as Phil reminded us again two weeks ago, good works are, are the fruit and not the root of salvation. I love that clever wordplay. Um, nowhere in, this, uh, in, in what we just read, right, in paragraph two, do we read anything or see anything about our works meriting the favor of God, right, um, or producing righteousness in us. Right, remember, going back to chapters, uh, the chapters on God's sovereignty and our salvation, right? particularly I'm thinking of chapter 11, which is on justification. Uh, we know that righteousness, our righteousness is derived from Christ, right? not from us, uh, in Christ alone. Right? It was his perfect life, right? his substitutionary atonement, affirmed in his resurrection from the dead, right? uh, and applied to us by his spirit, right? the Holy Spirit, which saved us. Uh, we merely work out what God has already worked in, right? Philippians 2.12 is, is, is speaks on that, right? On the contrary, our good works uh, appear to be, at least in part, a, a great benefit to ourselves, right? And, and even to others in the body of Christ. Of course, the, the larger the world, too. You know, I mean, which of us doesn't want to be more thankful, right? Um, or be assured in our own salvation? Do we not delight in the mutual edification of each other? I mean, think about what we're doing right now. When we come together to build one another up in discipleship, right? Um, we adorn the profession of the gospel. What does that mean, right? Stopping the mouths of adversaries, right? We do those things when we reveal the implications of the gospel in our lives through our daily living. That's how we adorn the gospel, right? Um, this can be both a great encouragement, right, as we, we seek to imitate those more seasoned in the faith, right, by their example, but also a clear and compelling witness again to the lost, right? When, 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 when not only do we preach the word of life, but we show what it does to a person, right? How God changes a person in and through that. What are the implications of that? So it's not just the word. It's, wow, this is a changed life. This person I knew, I could never imagine him like this. What is this about him? You know, um, stopping the mouths of adversaries, even people who would accuse us, persecute us, like the Romans, you know, who threw our brothers and sisters into the Colosseum to be fed to lions. And yet our brothers and sisters praying, singing, rejoicing in the Lord. What is this? They're not running. They're not in fear. You know, <laughs> Yeah, and it caused many of them to be like, this Jesus is the way. Um, uh, uh, and, but ultimately, and this is the key, the reason that our good works are so important, right, is because they bring glory to God, right? And that is the whole thing. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. Colossians 1, 16, uh, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rules or authorities, all things were created through him, and get this, for him. For him, Romans eleven thirty six, right? Romans doxology. But from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, Amen. Remember, we read earlier in Ephesians um two ten, we are his workmanship, right? We're being renewed in the spirit of our minds, made after uh, his likeness and true righteousness, right? And holiness. Therefore, we put off the old self with all of its corruption, right? Uh, um, and, and put on the new. We see that in Ephesians four twenty two through twenty four. Well, we're just as the builder of a house is worthy of more honor than the house itself, right? Someone who makes this a great thing or invents something. We may marvel at the thing, but ultimately it's the inventor who gets to go because he's the one that made it. He's the one that brought it into existence, right? So too is God who, 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 who's building this house of which we are living stones, right? This temple, he gets the glory and he's worthy of it all, right? And, and brothers and sisters, this, this needs to impact us, right? It needs to impact me. Uh, it, it needs to renew our minds and our interests, Right. It needs to bring about true repentance and and prioritize our spending, be it of time, resources, energy. This needs to inform the way that we live, um, because, again, it's all about him. It's all for him. Right. And the great joy of this, again, it's not just burden and duty. It's, it's joy. It's like he granted or rather privileged us to take part in this. Right. Think about it. God, God is the supreme being he, and he's building this kingdom and he allows us as unworthy as we are to, to take part in that. Where, where, where will we do Yes, it's all his glory. Absolutely. Amen. Right. And that kingdom will one day be uh, consummated. It will be with him face to face. So now that we know um, what good works are and why they're important, we, um, we, what we need to know is from whom specifically does God accept them 
And moreover, what is its source? And that's what paragraph three, um, again, for those of you who came in late, we're, paragraph four is pretty short, so we were kind of just doing a recap and, and a review of paragraphs one to three on our way to paragraph four. But um, last week, paragraph uh, three, our brother Greg went over and read, uh, their ability to do good works does not arise at all from themselves, but entirely from the spirit of Christ to enable them to do good works. They need, in addition to the graces they have already received, an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them, to will and to do his good pleasure. Yet this is no reason for them to grow negligent, as if they are not required to perform any duty without a special motion of the Spirit. Instead, they should be diligent to stir up the grace of God that is in them. Well, in short, the answer to that first question, right? Um, to, from, from whom does God accept these works? Uh, it's the born-again believer, right? The regenerate man and woman who's united to Christ by the Spirit of Christ, right? Um, we won't delve as deeply into the why for that, right? Because Brother Greg in about three weeks' time is going to treat that more thoroughly in paragraphs six and seven. Um, so for now, suffice it to say there are many people, right, who've done great things, right? We can think of many of these heroes, right? People we looked up to, role models in the world, right? Heroes both sung and unsung. Uh, people who committed their entire lives, right, to outwardly noble and, and, and even honorable pursuits, right? Sure, we can think of many, right? We have in mind the great philanthropists, uh, inventors, activists, emergency responders, military servicemen, perhaps some in our own family, right? World leaders, politicians. Maybe not so much in the last one, but <laughs> <laughs> you get my point. Um, there, there are people uh, who have done and continue to do great and extraordinary things, right? Great and extraordinary works, uh, works we ourselves likely profit from, right? Many of us got here today on some form of transit motorized transit, a car, right? Um, I know not if Henry Ford was saved, I don't, I don't know, but we certainly benefit from the work that he did, right? But though they be great works, they're not good works, not as God defines good, right? And certainly not if they're done for reasons other than for the love and glory of Christ. Again, if, if it's all for him, then, then the works need to be done for him. People can do... Yes, people can do outwardly beneficial things. You can help a lady cross the street, but if it's not ultimately for Christ, then it's for yourself, most likely. It's, it's for yourself. You can pat yourself in the back. I did a good deed today. Yeah. You know? And it's worthless. It's worthless in God's eyes. He says it's filthy rags, polluted garments, menstrual cloth. It's, it's, it's unacceptable, and it's, a, it's, it's an offense to him who's provided his son. You know? It's to say, who are we to say, here, God, take this instead of your son, who you promised to Abraham when you when you caught the ram in the thicket, and Abraham said, "Provide a lamb." No, here, take my good works instead. It's an it's it's a it's an affront, um, and, and and that's 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 the problem, right? Um, and it's all about Christ, you know. British mini, uh, missionary C. T. Studd, who in the late nineteenth century wrote he wrote this um it might have been a poem or a hymn, many of you might know it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Everything we do, if it's not for Christ, right? Like we sing at the end of the year often, all glory be to Christ. There's nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive. It's all for Christ, right? And, and, and as for the question about the source of our good works, we see that it's ultimately the Holy Spirit, right? And this is by no means to say, however, that we are at liberty to be passive bystanders, right? And, and that's what when we were talking about sanctification, right? Um, we see that there's a collaboration, there's a, there's a joint effort in it, right? God alone did the work of salvation, but we're responsible for, for, again, working out, not working for salvation, but working out what God has already worked in. Um, going back to Philippians, again, uh, uh, 2.12 through 13, we see that there's a joint effort of cooperation in production of good works, right? Um, we, while we need the Holy Spirit to influence and work in us, uh, both to will and to do His pleasure, and that He does, uh, we are obligated to be diligent, right, and to be deliberate, uh, in our efforts to 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 carry them out, right? We have to put our hands to the plow. We have to do the work, you know. And, and again, it's it's all foundational on the fact that we have a spirit that enables us to do it, you know. But we got to do it. Uh, and what this underscores, and I love how Jeffrey Smith and Gary Hendrick put it in the new exposition of the London Baptist Confession, six eighty nine, we're using that as a study guide and resource here, uh, is that quote: "Our need of the Holy Spirit." Enablement is a continual and ongoing need. We are not simply to live on the grace received at our conversion. Rather, um, the point is, is that when we are in constant need of grace. Constant need of grace. It's, we don't just, you know, 
We need his grace every day. Sufficient for, it's, for the day is its own troubles. Therefore, every day that God gives us to raise, we need his grace and we need to seek it. We need to pray, right? It's continual need reminds us how important it is to be regularly praying and striving for the Spirit's aid, right? In everything that we do to, to, to kill sin, right? To, to be bold and finally witness to that coworker or that person that we were hesitant or struggled to, to, to witness to, 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 to love our brethren, right? And to reach out and not be so much in our shells to, 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 to you know, to carry our cross, right? We need to be regularly and consistently praying for that and the Lord provides, right? She said, who for one and follow me, get the cross and come in with me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Colossians 1, 28 to 29. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So again, we see this, this dual collaboration in what Paul's talking about. And think about all the churches Paul planted, all the things that he did, right? He, he had to toil with his energy, right? And he had to work. Again, it was the energy that he had was what God powerfully worked in. So we see this this sort of uh, this collaboration uh, in 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 the production of good works and sanctification, right? So knowing the identity, importance, and source of good works. Now, at long last, at the very end, we come to our paragraph four: the limitation of uh, of good works. Um, we read, "They who, in their obedience, attain to the greatest height which is possible in this life, are so far from being able to supererogate." Uh, supererogate, that word always gets me, and to do more than God requires as that they fall short of much which in duty they are bound to do. So what, what is this telling us? Right? It's telling us that even in our pursuit of holiness, which yields, again, tangible right, and, and even measurable fruit, right? we can look at ourselves now and look at ourselves when we were saved and see the things that the Lord has done through us. Right? Um, Right, it, it, we can see that, right? Even in our pursuit of holiness, and, and even if hypothetically speaking, it were possible, right, to do all of that God requires. Of course, we know it's not. Of, of course, we know it's not. But even if, hypothetically speaking, follow me. If it were possible to do all of that, right, both inside and out, right, to uh, 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 to to be personally, uh, perpetually, and, and and perfectly, you know, pure in our in our in our seeking in in our striving after God, right, inside and out. We will only have done what God requires, nothing more. Right? Like, this is what we required. You want brownie points? You want a pound? But like, this is this is we're required to be righteous and to to live after God. It's not we're not going above and beyond in that. It may seem that because again we live in a fallen world and just just to do anything good seems like such an arduous task sometimes. But that's Adam was made to just obey God. Right and enjoy him, right? That out of that obedience, there was supposed to be joy, right? And, and we fell from that. Uh, here, the writers of the confession have Rome in mind, right? When we talk about that word supererogation, what you got to understand is that Roman Catholic theology teaches that a person can actually, uh, basically, exceed God's expectations, in, in essence, right? That they can be so good as to not only fulfill what God expects of them. Again, this is their theology, but also exceed it, right? Um, it, 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 it's, it's crazy. They can actually accumulate more merit than, than they themselves actually need. That's what, that's what the belief was, right? And according to them, said merit gets stored in a, a heavenly vault of, of sorts, right? To be drawn upon by other saints if they need it, right? And this was the principle behind indulgences, right? Well, you may recall from Luther's day with Johann Tetzel promising the peasants um, shorter, uh, 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 sentences in purgatory for their loved ones if they provide more, right? Provide more money. Uh, basically, there's, with, with the thought and the principle behind that was you provide more money, right? You do this charitable and good work that will exceed God's expectations and therefore your loved one in purgatory will go free. It's such a damning and, and horrible just lie, you know? And, and, and it's entirely unbiblical. Um, our marriage is found in Christ and Christ alone. Right. And in and, and, and as good as we can get, you know, speaking in terms of our practical righteousness, we'll only be doing what God expects. Nothing more. We can't exceed that. Right. And first of all, even to, I mean, I wouldn't belabor the point, but like, it's just not possible. Right. Uh, and the crucial question of the paragraph for today, right, is, is why? Like, why can't or won't a believer experience moral perfection 
uh, in this life, right? We know the reality on the ground, right? We know that it's not possible in terms of our ability or rather the lack thereof, Galatians 5.17, right? For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these things are opposed to one another, keeping you from doing the things you want to do. So we know on the ground, we know why we can't do it in terms of ability, right? The product of the fall, we live with the corruption in the flesh, right? The first T in tulip, right? Uh, us being reformed theologians, total depravity, right? Or total moral inability, uh, basically dictates that, right? All men, redeem men, even the best of us, sin, right? Sin dwells within. We, we still sin. We still wrestle with sin in the flesh, right? Paul in Romans 7 really explains that further in, him, in himself, right? Um, and we, like Job, rightly affirm our incompetence. Right, Job 9, 2 to 3, indeed, I know that this is true, right? He's responding to his friend Bildad and is accusing him basically of not being righteous and all that. I know that this is true, but how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wish to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Right? We're, we're, we're enabled, we're also incompetent to be able to, to stand the judgment of God and to, to meet that uh, moral perfection, that, that moral standard, right? But if we may ask, right? Why is it not possible at a fundamental level, right? And this is honestly something that I've, I've sort of been working through myself as I was preparing this. On the surface, right, the question may seem rather philosophical, and perhaps it is in many ways. However, I believe Scripture provides some clear uh, and valuable insight as to why, right? Again, why fundamentally? Um, much of it we actually have already covered indirectly. But consider the following observations. Observation A, right, as it relates to our salvation, Right? The glory, what is that? The acclaim, the praise, the adoration, the thankfulness, the thanksgiving, it belongs to God alone. Right? Soli Deo Gloria. Right? It doesn't belong to God in part, it belongs to God alone. You didn't say soli Deo Saint. Deo Me, exactly, exactly. Or, or uh, yeah, or soli Saint or Gloria. Which in Catholic Church, they <laughs> yeah. say praise to Saint Francis because Francis, Francis, Saint Francis is the lawyer. Yeah. Go to, the, to God and explain your problem. If it's a good lawyer, St. Francis give it to you there. Right, right. And we have, you have the whole calendar, right, basically filled with saints throughout, in, in Roman Catholic theology, throughout the, you can pray to for specific things, and it's like, you know, that's, 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 that's the danger of straying from God's word, right, um, and, and not giving God the glory alone, right? Ephesians 2, uh, 8 through 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing, is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no man may boast. Right? If we can do any of it, we can boast for at least some of it. Right? Um, observation B, right? If we could attain more perfection in this life, um, it, perhaps we'd see, we would perhaps to cease to depend on God, right? Yeah. right? If, we could, if we can achieve it in this life, right? Uh, why would we need God's grace to both sustain and grow us? Right? You got to wonder if we, like Jacob, would be wrestling with God, not willing to let go unless we receive that blessing, right? You know, in a, in a spiritual sense, why would we need to wrestle? Why would we want to continue to grasp and lay hold of the Lord if we can, if we would have achieved it, or even worse, have exceeded His expectations? You know, then we would, we would be able to look down to God, like I did it. You know, so that's that's one another reason. Observation C: As we read earlier in Colossians one twenty, God purposed to reconcile men specifically through the blood of His Son's cross, not our crosses. Right? We take up our crosses, representing the various trials and hardships that we face. Um, as we as we aim to live for God, right? And the, um, but the, these these crosses that we take up are, are are merely a reflection of our further conformity to Christ, right? It's not that we're doing it. It's it's we're doing it, and, and in so doing, we're looking more like Christ, right? And being conformed to Christ, right? And that's by design. We don't do it independently of Him. Lastly, observation D: perfection doesn't win you any brownie points, right? As I mentioned earlier, it's a requirement. God made man upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29, he's gone his own way. He made man upright. He, Adam was made and tasked to obey, right? And he didn't, and, and we and Adam don't either, right? Um, it's like when, we, you know, when, when someone does a kindness to you, someone, who, someone whose job it is to do something for you and you thank them for that, maybe like a civil servant, you go to the post office and they, they just do something for you, they say, don't thank me, I'm just doing my job. That's, that's essentially the spirit that that Jesus is telling us that we need to have, right? When we look at Luke 17, 10, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what is our duty. It shouldn't look for a pat on the back no. for everything we do. Yeah. Because we're only doing what we're supposed like, to do. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. 
It's like, you know, you, you say thank you for doing the dishes, like when I was younger, <laughs> you know, that's, your, that's your job. <laughs> you get to live here for free. You know, and we have the grace of God for free. And, and again, the joy is that we can take part in the building of his kingdom, you know, and, and that we've been redeemed and saved and we know that we're loved and we can, we can do these things out of love. It's like, what, what other reward are we looking for? We already have everything in Christ. Um, and that, that concludes, uh, again, our lengthy chap, uh, recap of chapters one through three and then paragraph four, uh, paragraphs one through three and paragraph four. Um, I went kind of fast, sorry, because I was trying to cover it all. Anyone have any questions? I Comments? I, I understood, so if I understood, because it was, it was good. All right. <laughs> Amen. Thank, <laughs> thank the Lord. He answers yeah. prayer. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord, yes. Amen. Well, let's... Uh, Let's close out as we pray to go into our uh, service. Uh, Father, Lord, our God, Lord, we, we thank you, O oh God. Lord, we thank you that Christ did the, the, the good work, O oh Lord. And in him and through him, O oh Father God, you, you use us to, to impact the world, O oh Lord. To love one another, to proclaim boldly the gospel that can bring men from death to life, O oh God. Lord, we thank you that you um, work uh, with us, O oh Father God. You enable us, but you, 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 we're responsible, O oh Father God, to, to answer that charge and that call and to live a life worthy of the calling, O oh Lord. God, please help us. Lord, please help us, O oh Father God, to, 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 to count all as, as dumb, for the also passing worth of knowing Christ. Lord, please help us, O oh Father God, to, to in everything that we do, to do it from motivation of love for Christ, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, if, if we like the, the, the Ephesian church, O oh Father God, have fallen from our first love, O oh God, Lord, may we remember May we repent, may we return, O oh Lord. O oh Father God, and we, we, may we do so head, headlong, head first, O oh Father God. Uh, Lord, please be with us, O oh Father God. Continue to bless and guide us, O oh Lord. May you bless the preaching of your word as we will hear momentarily, O oh Father God. And, and, and may you be blessed in the fellowship of your saints here this day. Um, thank you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.